Morning, people. I want to share a couple thoughts with you today. You can see this is a very old book. It's one of the original version of, of versions of uh, Grant's memoirs. It was printed in 1868, and it is in rough shape. But it's amazing. This is the book that kept his wife from starving to death because he was just about broke at the time of his death. And by miracle, he was able to pull this off and get it printed. You can see there's the date, 1868. And here's what I want to share with you. This is the venerated general of the North. Of course, the Union, anti-slave Union. And uh, this was his general order number 11. Dated December 17th, 1862, Oxford, Mississippi, the subject of trade in the insurrectionary states after they had been brought within the lines of the Union Army has become a matter of great importance and in blah, 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 many cases deficient and being means of aid affording aid and enemy to the to the, aid and comfort to the enemy grant's first desire was to suppress all trade and he was especially severe upon the jews particularly german jews who followed the union camp and having no nationality felt themselves in no way bound by oaths or obligations of any kind but pursued their own private interests regardless of every other consideration that was profiteering Carpetbaggers, they were not Yankees carpetbaggers. These were German Jews who learned from their grandpappies to follow the Goyim when they went to war under Napoleon and uh, the commanders of the Prussian army like Blucher and Wellington of the English and just follow them crazy Goyim. And the old axiom of ride to the sound of guns is what a Goyim does. To a Mashpuka, he rides to the sound of guns because he knows there's guilt Gelt in them hills. So the Jews would basically buy from the Union Sutters and quartermasters flour, sugar, coffee, foodstuffs. And they would pay 10 to 20 times more than those bags of food were worth and sell them to the starving Confederates for thousands of percentages above the cost. Some of these Jewish people became the Lehman Brothers, who made so much money so quick they had to open up dry goods stores all throughout the South. The names Goldman Sachs ring a bell? That's their grand grand great granddaddies. That's who some of these Mushpoka were. Metro Goldwyn Mayer had ancestors that were involved in this. And Grant came down upon them like the hammers of hell. And so here's his order, general order number eleven. December 17, 1862, and this is what Grant said. The Jews, as a class, violating every regulation of trade established by the United States Treasury, also department orders, are hereby expelled from the department within 24 hours from receipt of this order by all post commanders. They will see that this class of people are furnished with passes and required to leave. And anyone returning after such notification will be arrested and held in confinement until opportunity occurs, sending them out as prisoners, unless furnished with permits from these headquarters. No passes will be given to these people to visit headquarters for the purpose of making personal application for trade permits. Now, that's Grant. By the way, they go on to say that these people are held in equal contempt by the Confederates. That's the Union. The people who wanted to free slaves locking up German Jews. Now I will continue. I'm going to read a passage from the bad guy, Robert E. Lee, head of the South and the Southern Army. This is on his way north to Gettysburg. And here's his general order number 73, dated June 27th, 1863. That's approximately four days before the Battle of Gettysburg. The commanding general has observed with marked satisfaction the conduct of the troops on the march. 
and confidently anticipates results commensurate with the high spirit they have such manifested. No troops have displayed greater fortitude or better performed their arduous marches of the past 10 days. Their conduct in other respects has, with few exceptions, been in keeping with the character as soldiers and entitles them to the appropriation and praise, approbation and praise. There have, however, been instances of forgetfulness on the part of some, and they have, in keeping the yet unsullied reputation of the army and the other duties exacted of us by civilization and Christianity are not less obligatory in the country of the enemy than in our own. The commanding general considers that no greater disgrace could befall the army and through it our whole people than the perpetration of the barbarous outrages upon the unarmed and defenseless and the wanton destruction of private property that have marked the course of the enemy in our own country. He's talking about the Yankees and how we molested innocent Southern civilians. Such proceedings not only degrade the perpetrators and all connected with them, but are subversive of the discipline and efficiency of the army and the destructive of the ends of our present movement. It must be remembered that we make war upon armed men and that we cannot take vengeance for the wrongs our people have suffered without lowering ourselves in the eyes of all whose abhorrence has been excited by the atrocities of our enemies and offending against him to whom vengeance belongeth without whose favor and support our efforts must all prove in vain. The commanding general therefore earnestly exhorts the troops to abstain with most scrupulous care from unnecessary and wanton injury to private property, and he enjoins upon all officers to arrest and bring to summary punishment all who shall in any way offend against orders on this subject, Robert E. Lee. So when you try to judge the past, you better know who and what you're talking about. And all this nonsense about slave owners, Abraham Lincoln's father was one of the first in his family that didn't own slaves. But basically, if you were white and free in America up until about 1840, you either owned a slave or you were one. And for all you sanctimonious lefties out there, you're here as a white person, most likely because your ancestors were slaveholders, because most of the white slaves in history were killed. All you Indios read about the slaveholding of the Cherokee, what the Sioux would do to the Arikara or the Crow. Read about what Cree would do when they saw a Sioux and a Sioux is Cheyenne. That's the tragedy of humanity, the curse of Cain and Abel. My grandfather is a Spartan Greek. My grandmother was from Messenia Pilos. My grandmother's family were enslaved by my grandfather's family. That's the history of Sparta and Messenia. When I hear some ignorant person say history repeats itself, it makes me want to vomit after I laugh. Most of y'all don't know history. Most people don't have time. They're self-absorbed. I get that. But looking at these retarded children out protesting when they know from nothing of which they speak, they don't know the history of their own families, much less their own nation, it took 81 years for America to throw slavery and the yoke and curse that it was off of our back. We were all enslaved by slavery as American Christian people. It took but 81 years from 1789 to 1862 to throw that evil off this country brought here by Europeans and other people. 
many of which were Mideastern Arabs. Many of the slaves gathered and sold to Arabs, Jewish merchants, Venetians, Portuguese, Dutch, Germans, English, were sold by blacks. The tribal hatred and warfare in Africa today is worse than ever. More Africans will be slaughtered today by other blacks, Africans, than, than took place in a year, a hundred years ago. When you listen to the industry of this race baiting, and it is an industry, and where was the governor of Virginia? Where were his police? You think God didn't watch? I will tell you that helicopter, that crash, that, that's God telling the government, you better get your crap together. You better stop playing the peeper, Governor McAuliffe, you liar, you hypocrite, you weasel, you rat. Know the truth, people, it'll set you free.